the VAR show the one place for your weekly football update So hello everyone welcome to another webinar series i would like to first thank steve darvi for coming and uh, you know making this possible and also everyone who is joining in today for the webinar so i'll just give a small intro before we start and it is regarding our guest steve darvi so he has a lot of experience he has managed all across asia multiple countries multiple clubs he has managed the likes of mohan bagan he has been involved in mumbai city he has also managed thailand national team laos to name a few among all lot of other things so without wasting much time i would like to straight get into it so you know like i'll begin the uh, question here by asking you first and it's like steve like you did not have a playing career so how difficult was it for you to forge your career out of management or in coaching how difficult was it for you to you know get into coaching Um yeah the, it's a fair question which I get asked a great deal because but well, basically I think you do need to play as much as you can at any level I don't care what level it is keep playing keep playing because that's where you learn the, the game it's where you learn to put the pictures in your head um if you if you go on to the belief that you have to be a great player to be a great coach then in reality then only Maradona or Pele should have coached which obviously is not going to be true but and also there's often the case of fantastic players like Maradona and etc don't actually make good coaches because they possibly don't understand the reality of teaching someone to get better because they were just so naturally gifted uh, you know fantastic you know, i would love to have been a great player don't get me wrong you know i'd rather have been a great player than a great coach you know that would be i've been perfectly honest because there's nothing beats playing uh but my advice to young coaches and to some of these people who are not analysts is play play five a side play a le- play, play anything you want because you then start to learn about the distances on the pitch about the uh you know, the speed of the game about how sometimes you can't do what you can do on a blackboard or you do on a computer you you have to you know you learn the, the realities of football definitely and uh, that's a very good advice i think so applicable for many so like i'll start with rajat rajat do you have anything to ask i i just wanted to add up on that and wanted to ask that it's, it's very difficult for uh, coaches to right now have a career in coaching uh, and also uh, uh, like uh, sustain themselves because coaching at any grassroots level is not competitive or uh, enough for you to have a uh, like a full time career in coach i want to ask you about your experience which was your breakthrough uh, job where you went to full time and how did you manage coaching for that well i mean i i do honestly believe in luck in the game there is luck there's good luck and bad luck um and i also believe there's right place right time and who you know so i often tell young coaches as well build a network build a network of people because you never know and be good to people because you never know when that comes back uh i've got to the situation now at my age where some of my ex players are now presidents of clubs uh and in senior positions so they will in turn recommend me and things like this so um how it started was i was i was very lucky i was i was playing and i, I did my coaching badges because I, i wanted to learn i was i trained to be a pe teacher which helped the organizational side but also um i was actually finished my degree went teaching and then i got a phone call to say do i want to go to work in bahrain uh as like assistant national coach i was 24 uh and i thought well what i just swam there i'll be honest um because it was a case of i was never going to be a star player i was getting paid to play but not a great deal i, I would have been good semi pro or low paid professional depends on you know your view um so i went to bahrain and that's where you literally i was 24/7 football and to to have a career you really got to you know, be 24/7 in football because there's a thousand people you know behind you like when i was a, a kid at 16 
my first wage at football was eight pound a week. I don't know what that is in in rupees, but I know it's not a lot. Uh, and someone said to me once, "Why would you play for eight pound a week?" And I said, "Well, if I didn't, there's about a thousand kids behind me who'd have played for seven pound, another thousand behind playing for six pound, because everyone wanted to be a footballer. So I was just happy to get paid to be a footballer. Um, so that was the most important thing is to to get the passion. You, you have to have passion for the game." You've got to be lucky. You've got to be the right place at the right time, and I think most of all, you've got to work hard. You know, it's there's no shortcuts. You've got to study. You've got to read. You've got to watch. You've got to listen. You don't have to accept everything's right. Yeah, you know, I, I watch everybody, and they might if they're good, I'll pinch the ideas. If they're not good, I'll just say, okay, I, it's not for me. But I, I, I will never criticise publicly any other coaches. I think we have enough enemies in the media. Uh, to, to bother having other coaches criticize each other. Definitely, and like uh, okay, uh, I'll move to the next. Uh, Mahesh, do you have any questions? You can go forward and ask. So, like you are, you have been lost for a long time now. So, how do you think the current squad, current situation of your national team? Well. I didn't quite hear the full question because the static, but I'm 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 not in Laos anymore. Uh, I left Laos after the World Cup qualifying finished, uh, so I'm back in England. So it, I'm not in Laos, but I really enjoyed my time there. It was you know coaching in the World Cup was like a professional ambition. Uh, we knew we weren't going to win the World Cup. <laughs> we knew we weren't going to qualify for the World Cup, but. Uh, we we tried to what we call we had a, like a an aim was to bridge the gap, and the first step was to bridge the gap to Thailand and Malaysia and Vietnam, and we did we narrowed that, and then we got what we call good results, and that would be like a two 0 defeat about from Kuwait, a two 0 defeat against Lebanon. We got decent results, we got absolutely battered by Korea, <laughs> and let's put this way we got beat eight nil, and I'll be honest I was happy. <laughs> you know, we were lucky to get nil. Uh, I mean, and the difference was they had two EPL players playing. They had three more who were in the Bundesliga, and the other five or six were either in the K League or the Chinese League. And our lads were were basically semi pro. You know, they weren't full timers even. So we survived 60 minutes. But after 60 minutes, when you play players of that level, you run out of petrol, and literally our lads were running on the spot. So they just physically, you cannot do anything about it. Uh, no matter what, pe- no matter how organised you are, if somebody just kicks the ball past you and runs, and you cannot catch him, there's nothing you can do about it. And Korea were Korea were top class. You know, Son Hun Ming played that day. He only scored three and made two. You know, and uh, I, yeah, I'll, I'll be quite honest. Uh, our instructions were, or my instructions were, to was to kick him as hard as we could on the halfway line. Uh, Basically, being that hopefully that if we kicked him, he'd go off because he had a Premier League game at the weekend and he earned a lot of money playing there. He might want to walk off from Lao, you know, and just but he didn't. He stayed on. Uh, and, and to be fair to the lad, he came up to me at the end, shook my hand, said and laughed and said, "I saw what you were trying to do." He said the boy tried very hard, and the, the, the boy did. We just couldn't get near him. Just could not get near him enough to kick him even. That's the difference in standards that you're talking about. So, you know, it was a fascinating experience being a, a, a coaching at that level. Uh, I really enjoyed it. You know, the, the money in Laos wasn't as good as the money in India, but I wasn't doing it for money. I was doing it for more like the professional ambition at that stage. Steve, a follow-up question to that. Uh, uh, so, so you keep uh, you I. I I saw your career. You 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 coached a lot of teams. So uh, let's say you get a new team, and it's it's you're in the first month. What's what's the first thing that you go to and try to change in the team? Like, uh, what's the first thing that that is like you think of is 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 the biggest edge that you straight away go and try to improve? Right. Well, first thing you do is you assess your players because. I believe I'd, I'd be called as a players' coach because my view is that the players matter, the president doesn't matter, the media don't matter, the committee don't matter because they'll like you if you win. 
And the only people that are going to make you win are the players. So you've got to do the right thing by the players. So I like to assess them. Firstly, technically, are they good enough? And sometimes you walk into a club and the committee have been, I've already bought the players for you. And I try not to do that because that can be a disaster if you have someone who's got no idea about football, who's actually picked all your players. Then you look at them physically. Are, are they good specimens physically? Uh, do they need training? I mean, often in some cases in Asia, I've had to reduce the training, not increase it, because the players are burnt out often. Because sadly, local coaches get a lot more pressure than foreigners. Foreigners, I can just walk off and go home. But a local coach has got to live there forever. So it's difficult for him. And especially if a powerful managed president says these players aren't fit, run them. And they run them into the ground. You know, but I found that in India in particular, players were so injured so often. You know, and it's so important that you, ha you have your players fit. That's where Mumbai City were excellent. They had loads of masseurs, physios, doctors, good people, good professionals. And their job was to get our players as fit as they could on the pitch, especially the schedule of the ISL, which is very difficult. So I looked at... I look at firstly the players, then I look at my staff, and I and I, I make sure that the, the physio is a good one. Um, I mean, the, the other staff are bonuses, like the goalkeeper coach and things like this. But So I look at that, and then the main thing is when I look at new players, if I do get new players, I look if, obviously, they've got to be a good player, otherwise I wouldn't want them. But the next thing is I look at them as people, because it's so important to have a good person in dressing room. Uh, I've had teams... Parak, Home United, the Thailand national team, were I had good people. I was really, really lucky. And they were good professionals who sorted problems out themselves. They were you know, dedicated, enthusiastic. And I've had other teams where you've had a few, two or three, I'll say bad lads, bad professionals in the club who were playing for themselves, who were selfish. They weren't playing for the team. And it really does disrupt the whole the whole pattern uh, you've got and you've got to get rid of them sometimes sometimes you can convert them if you're lucky but other times you can't you know i've had players come up to me and say i, I want a goal bonus well i won't give goal bonuses uh i give team bonuses because if you give a goal bonus he'll try and shoot from a corner you know or he'll never pass it he'll get the byline and try and screw it in rather than laying it back so it's really difficult i mean it's hard to you know. It's hard to say because a lot of African lads are extremely selfish about playing, because and I, I had one of my own African players in Parak explain this to me. He said, "Coach, you've come from a country where you have poor people, but you don't have poverty, and a lot of these lads have come from poverty where their wage is literally feeding maybe a hundred people, feeding an extended family, which doesn't happen in England." He says, "So they don't see." The team game, they see the game as being purely money for them to feed their family, which I understand. But you've got, and but it's not every African player, obviously, because I've had some great ones. But you do tend to get that with lads who've come from an area of poverty where there hasn't been a great football education as well, uh, like in a good academy system, or even informal education of schoolwork where you get values and ethics. Uh, that's when you'll have players with problems. You know, I mean, I, I don't get me wrong, you know, English lads are like that as well. You know, a lot, a lot of the English lads have problems with drinking. Uh, so you've got to make sure that you, your lads aren't drinkers. And al I've had alcoholics, uh, players who are very good players, but who are actually alcoholics. They've come training absolutely stinking of alcohol because they've been up all night drinking. Or they've had, they've had whiskey for breakfast. You know, and they're still good players, but I keep saying to them, imagine how good you could be if that whiskey was replaced with coffee you know and sometimes you win sometimes you don't you don't win sometimes you lose definitely so uh you know on that i'll, I'll ask one question uh she, this is from mohul mishra he could not be here so he i sent you the question earlier also it's like uh you have since you have managed in india and uh in asian uh, south asian side why aren't players allowed drinks break every half due to the heat like in England, it has started, but the temperature is much kinder there than it's here. So, what is your opinion? Like, why isn't it allowed? Um, 
they're, they're having a drinks break at the moment, as you can see in EPL. And it's a joke because sometimes it's 12 degrees here. <laughs> you know, the lads, you'd be drinking tea and coffee rather than, you know, drinks. But it, it, there's, there's, the logic in UK was done because of COVID, because of the, the virus. But the logic in Southeast Asia, I agree, is different, where literally the players are absolutely pouring with sweat and in the temperature. So my brain says exactly what you say. There should be some form of drinks break uh, in, we'll say, India. And maybe it's not a, a country-specific thing. Maybe it's a temperature-specific thing. So if the temperature is, I'll say 30, it could be... To 30 to an Englishman, believe me, is horrific. You know, I know 30 to someone in Mumbai isn't that much, you know, uh, or in Saudi Arabia. But I'll say 30 for a number. If the temperature hits 30 if, before the game, the referee looks and says, OK, we will have a drinks break after 25, 25 minutes, you know, and in the first half, 25 minutes in the second half. It, it, it's only good for the game. It only makes the players better. And if they're pros and they're playing in front of the crowd, you do want the best performance. I mean, that's like I, I keep saying to people, one of the biggest faults in Asian football is the quality of the pitches. You know, if you're paying pe people to, if people are coming in to pay to watch you play football, why not have the best pitch you can? Because the football will be better. Uh, rather than huge long grass or no grass or swamp even in some cases, you know, you get a good pitch, you'll get better football. Uh, so I, I think that's important. Good pitches, good training grounds, so young kids get better technique. Uh, and the drinks break, hey, I'm all for it. Sure. And, uh, okay, I'll ask one more question before I go on to side. And it's like, this is my personal question. And like, uh, you know, you have managed in both club and country level. So how difficult is it for you as a coach to adjust your game style? Like when you're managing a country and you have to go to a club? Well, it's the jobs are different, no doubt. And the biggest difference is the, the, obviously the contact time with your players. Club football, day in, day out. National team, you might not see them for three months sometimes then you've suddenly got them 24 hours a day in a camp so the biggest difference is trying to get a, a, a relationship to get like a personal relationship with the player my view is you coach the person first the player will come second in that if you can't get through to the person you will never get through to the player because that, that's so important personal behavior so as a club it's easier because you see them every day in a national team, it's not that easy. You know, sometimes you just don't get to know some of your players because it's, it's hard. Then you're the, another problem sometimes, and this happens if you're a foreign coach. Sometimes the local coach of a club doesn't like you. Hey, that's been you know whether you like that or not to reality. And what they do is they'll sometimes not do what you wish them to do with their club players. Sometimes it sounds awful. They're not very good club coaches. You know, some are great, don't get me wrong, but there are some bad club coaches. Let's be honest, some are match fixers. You know, we all know that. I read about that in Goa recently. That is match fixing in Goa, not even in the I League or the you know, regional league. So, but often as well, I would get national team players coming in who are absolutely exhausted because the club hasn't been coaching them, the club's been running them. And players that come in, the first thing they do for two days is give them a rest. And give them massages uh, and you know, bring masseurs in because their legs were gone. And there's no point bringing somebody in if they're absolutely knackered. So it's not easy doing that. You, As a national coach, you've got to develop a good relationship with the club coaches in the league where your players come from. Sometimes it works, you know, but sometimes it doesn't. I, I used What I used to do when I first went in as a national coach was I would ask every club coach to give to me what he felt should be the national team. If he was picking the national team, what would he pick? And it's interesting, like if, if one player, if one coach picks nine players from his club, then you think, well, maybe his opinion isn't that good, you know. Uh, and you, you then start to say, well, OK, if someone's pretty objective about it, you think, well, OK, he makes good, sensible decisions there. I respect that. And then also, if, for example, if you've got a 10-team league, and nine of the ten coaches say the best right back, you know, 
is, is Subramanian, then you say, well, hey, Subramanian must be a decent player. If mo all the coaches are saying that. So you look at Subramanian more than you would somebody else. So it, it, you know, it can be useful. Local knowledge is essential as well. You can't forsake local knowledge if you're a national coach. You have to harness local knowledge. Uh, and also, if you get to know local coaches, they can often help you with what a player is like. You know, is the player a good lad? Is he honest? Is he a cheat? Is he a match fixer? You know, let's, let's be honest. Hey, I had players in La who I knew were match fixing. But what could I do about it? Because they were fantastic trainers. They were two of the best 11 in my best 11 by far. I couldn't not pick them. Uh, they never let me down in the national team because, as I found out later, they never fixed in international games. They only fixed at club level or they fixed in friendlies away from home because they saw that as a source of income. You know, and then, so what do you do? But I knew that was happening, but I couldn't do anything about it because I couldn't prove it. And if I didn't prove it, I just dropped them. I'd have the media on my back and I'd have to say why I dropped them. And if I picked them, they were doing all right anyway. So there's some of the complexities you find that happen in coaching behind the scenes. Uh, you know, it's not an easy job. You get complex situations. And often the football is the, is the easiest part of the job. Definitely. So I'll move on from that and I'll ask uh, Syed Ainali. You can ask your questions, Syed. I think you are on mute. Will this go out as a a program, or is it going to be just a no? Skype? I'm recording it. Uh, yeah, it'll go out also. Uh, okay. <laughs> if you do not want to give anything controversial, uh, then it's no, fine. I've learned, uh -huh. I've learned that uh, what you say, you're going to make sure <laughs> that you're right. So I'm okay. Don't worry. If I say it, no problem. That's why you'll see I never say any names, <laughs> unless oh, yes. I say nice things about people. Oh, yes. You can, people. You can uh, sneak in your Bollywood story also. Oh, Those Rambir Kapoor. Days. Yeah, I can sleep in Rambir Kapoor. I can honestly say I've danced with Rambir Kapoor, which uh, I know a lot of Indian lads think that's wonderful. I'd never heard of him. I I I'll be honest. I'd never. He was just a bloke who was a president and a lovely fella. He really was a nice bloke. And then all the lads were telling me about it, and I'm going, oh, yeah, you know. And then I, later I got asked to, I was did, I did the football choreography for a film called Student of the Year. Have you seen it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I, well, you'll see in that film my feet. My feet are in there. Because one of the lads was a great actor and a good-looking fellow, far better looking than me. Uh, he couldn't kick a ball, so they had to use my feet to kick the ball. And then we panned to his head you know, for the shot. So uh, I, I love. I ended up loving Bollywood. I really did. I love the film uh, Bodyguard. Uh, the cricket film I think is fantastic. I can't remember the name. Ah, oh, great film with the all Lagan. the all. What was it again? Lagan. Lagan. That's it. Yes, where those damn British colonials got battered. I agree with them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it was. I mean, the history I found out about India was just incredible. I. I knew, I realised I knew nothing about Indian history and the, particularly the role of the British colonials uh, until I went to Calcutta and then Mumbai, more Calcutta, I learned a lot in Calcutta. I, I read about a lot of the history there and going to some of the old clubs in Calcutta and, you know, it was, I'll be honest, the, the colonial bit was appalling what they did. You know, I'm mean, ashamed at what they did. Uh, and then I went to Manipur which was a fantastic place, I'll be honest. And they took me to a, a cemetery, which in the middle of this city, they have the most magnificent cemetery of, uh, they call them the Tindits, where there was hundreds of graves of British people, 18 and 19 year old lads who died uh, on that border uh, with the Japanese coming over into India. I didn't know anything about it, I'm ashamed to say. You know, it was, it's fascinating what goes on. I mean, India fascinated me full stop. It's 22 different countries. Absolutely. You know, you, you can't say I'm an Indian. I think you are you come from a different part. And that seems to be the difference. And I've got to be honest, 
it's probably the most racist place I've seen. Yeah, I've had Indian lads say to me, you British treat me all right. It's the so-and-so's up, up there or the northerners don't treat me any good or the, I'm from Kerala, I'm, I'm the wrong colour, you know. Um, I couldn't believe all that, you know. Yeah, yeah, please, sir, we can hear you. Yeah. No, yes. I've got nothing. Yeah, please, uh, go ahead with the question, I can hear you. Okay, so is it difficult to get 100% out of the players while they're playing for the country because they have commitment to, to the club? So if they get injured for a country match, like their sanities or something from the club will be stopped or they'll have discussions that size. It's difficult to get 100% out of the players. Right, I, I think if I get the question right, it's difficult. Is it how do you get 100% out of the players for country if they're tied to a club? Yeah, it's a, it's a fair question. Uh, some players, it's not a problem. Some players just play for their country, sheer pride. They play for their country, they play for the national anthem. Like the Vietnamese do that, I'll be honest. The Vietnamese, when I had played there, worked there, they were definitely nationalistic. They were proud to play for their country. Um, others, it's difficult sometimes. For example, if you're getting paid, I'll say 5,000 US a, a month to play for your club, and you're getting paid nothing to play for your country, uh, you've got to start thinking, who's paying the mortgage? Who's paying for the, the kids' school? Who's paying for your, your grandmother's hospital? And, you know, it's it's difficult. I understand and I respect the people who have difficulties like that. When you come to England, it's different. The players tend to play for honour for the country uh, in as much that because they're so well paid by the club. The money's they're not going to be able to match it. And, in fact, now the England national team usually donate their match fee to a charity. Uh, I mean, some play for the honour, like your Jordan Hendersons, I think. But you'll get others who, I'll be honest, they, they realise if you play for England, you'll get more sponsorship, you'll get more marketing value, uh, you'll get more Instagram hits. So there, there's the mercenary side of it as well, that if you're playing for your country, it benefits your brand, as they say, if you're a European footballer. Uh, if you're an Asian footballer, you might be playing for your country for honour and it, you might be really weary about getting injured because if you get injured, some of these clubs are ruthless and they they won't care about you. But it's a fair question. You know, it's, it, it does happen. Sure, no, we'll move to Mahesh. Mahesh, do you have any question? Yeah, so Steve... Uh, there are different types of personality in the team. So how do you think we can manage the different personalities? There are some big personalities, some, some have ego problem or some have different, there are different personalities. So how can you manage them in the team? Yeah, um, excellent question because I couldn't agree more with you. You walk into a dressing room, 11 people think you're a genius. They're the ones you've picked. Five or maybe think you're a genius. They're on the bench. And the rest think you're stupid because you haven't picked them. <laughs> and that those figures rotate. So as soon as I drop someone, I go from being a genius to an idiot. So that's a reality. And when, of the 11 in that team, I'm, I describe it as there's 11 different buttons I've got to press. And sometimes the button is easy. That, you just, that player will play no matter what. No matter what I say, that player's going to play for the love of the game, for the love of the club, whatever. People like your Brian Robsons, for example, who would die for their country or for their club. You know, they're great. You want 11 Brian Robsons, 11 Peter Reeds, Stephen Gerrards, Jordan Hendersons. If you had 11 like that, you'd be easiest job in the world. But you get others, 
you know, to be honest, who are, are different. And you've got to find what makes them tick, what makes them play. For some, it's being nice to. For some, it's being horrible to. Uh, for some, you never find it. You never get through to some. You know, there's players I've just failed with. Uh, I've tried everything, just didn't work. They didn't like me. I didn't like them sometimes. Um, I've still I've still picked players if I didn't like them. I don't care about liking someone. If he's scoring goals every week, I don't care if I like him or not, as long as he's scoring goals, because the team result is will keep me in a job. Not liking him will. So it's 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 complex. You like to think you get it right most of the time, but you don't get it right all of the time. It's you know, as I said, I've been lucky sometimes. You know, the quality of a person is so important that makes the player. And if you're lucky to get good players, I had a great player, um, a couple of great players in Mohan. I had Syed Nabi and Anwar Ali, uh, Shilton Paul. They were good players. They were good, honest professionals. Pradeep, they were lads who I could respect. I trusted. They played for the club. They played for themselves. You know, they were really good people. And similarly, that happened in... In Mumbai, I had a couple of local lads who were genuinely uh, wanted to play for the club. Uh, Paul, the goalkeeper, you know, absolute madman, but a great goalkeeper and a great professional. Uh, so you get people like that. I mean, recently there's been a Netflix documentary come out about Nicholas and Elka. Um, now, people have had problems with him and you've seen that in the past. When he was at Mumbai, he was absolutely top class. Uh, we didn't have a single problem with him. He was hardworking, dedicated, sincere, professional. And so it does make you think that he clicked at Mo Mumbai in terms of as a person, as a, you couldn't ask for better. In some places, he didn't click. Uh, I, I don't know the answer how we did it. Uh, it might have been a mixture of him. And us, I'll say us, because it wasn't obviously, it's the whole staff working together. But you'll get that, you know, you, you do need good people. Sometimes the personality, you can, as I said before, you can't get through. And if they're causing problems, you have to say, so Alex Ferguson was very good at that. Ferguson, if he couldn't cure them, he got rid of them. He cut the cancer out. He just give them the flick. Time to go, son, you're gone. Beckham was the example, obviously. I don't think it was Beckham. I think it was the influence of his, of his wife and the, and the PR people around him that were taking. Because I've only heard good things about David Beckham as a player, as and as a pro. Uh, but Ferguson said, "Right, that's time to go." Bang! He got rid of Stam when he felt Stam wasn't the right person. So someone like Ferguson was brutal. And when Klopp came in, Klopp, you know, Klopp's a great motivator. But you'll also notice he got rid of a lot of players. Uh, he got rid of the deadwood. He got those rid of those who were cheating. So he's got rid of them, and he brought in players like your Van Dykes and Allisons, who are good professionals. Definitely, like I, I have a follow up on that. You know, like uh, like like you said, like uh, like Jurgen uh, when he came, he removed the deadwoods, and of course, like uh, every coach is not lucky to remove them in one window or one uh, season. How do you? incorporate them knowing that they will not be going out this season um yeah because i mean in europe and i believe this fully that if a person's got a contract he keeps the contract because that's a man's living it's not his fault someone's given him a contract that long it's not his fault he's getting that much money i never like memodosal he's getting paid to do nothing now he, to me he should be Part of the blame is him. He should be performing because he should be earning the money. But I don't blame him for getting that money. I blame the person that gave him the money. Uh, if I can't get rid of the player, like, for example, Arsenal can't get rid of Ozil. So what do you do? Well, in some cases, they just, the first team coach will send them to the youth team. It's not perfect, but you, you have to do it. You just don't use them in training. Uh, and and some p players, some coaches try and force the player out, make him feel not wanted. Now, some say, I'm sick of this. I'm going. They, they break the contract mutually. They go and sign somewhere else where they're happy. No problem. But some, like we'll say, Mimitozel seems to have done. He wanted to stay. He doesn't care. Not, not an easy answer. 
there's no easy there's no there's no wonderful formula for it if I, if I had it I'd probably be a millionaire I'd be coaching Arsenal probably then to get Ozil to I have a question. Uh, it's it's uh, so you've you've been uh, you've coached both at Mohan Bagan and uh, Mumbai City FC. So uh, basically, I League and ISL. Uh, uh, so I, I want to know uh, what what's the difference? Uh, what's the difference you felt? Uh, have is is has ISL been more like has there been increase in professionalism with the introduction of ISL? Uh, has there been any sort of quality uh, in Indian football with ISL? Well, I, I can only speak from the period I was there, obviously. But basically, I'd say the ISL improved the professionalism by about a about thousand percent. <laughs> it was absolutely night and day compared to the I League, compared to the ISL. The ISL did everything they could to to create a professional atmosphere. The backroom staff, the logistics, uh, the, the payments on time, that matters, believe me. Uh, the quality of contracts. It, it, it was Mumbai, again, only speak for Mumbai. Mumbai were absolutely top class in everything that they did. Um, I mean, I felt sorry in hindsight that unscrupulous, I'll use that word, you could say criminal, agents came in in the first time in the, in the ISL and literally ripped some of these clubs off. Uh, some of the players were earning money they shouldn't have, some of the foreigners. Uh, it was a disgrace. They were absolutely cheating. Now, some didn't, some were good. Uh, I thought Robert Perez was good when he came. There was a, a Alano play, was from top class. So you got some of them who were really, really, an Elka. You got some who were really, really good. But you got others who shouldn't have been, firstly, some came and cheated, that's being honest, some of the top stars. They just went, went through the motions. Then you had others who came in who would, who would never have got that money in Europe, were getting European standard money in India, and they weren't good enough. Uh, that wasn't their fault. That was because the, the agents were getting a fortune. So I think they've learned since the ISL, they've, and also how they recruited was done better now. Uh, they, they have, some of the people who recruited didn't know about football. Uh, and I mean that in the nicest possible way. You had people on the committee choosing the players, and it's like I'm not an accountant, so you wouldn't ask me to do the books. You know, I'm not a doctor. You wouldn't ask me to cure a person who's sick. Uh, but that's what ha happens in football. You'll get someone who thinks, "Oh, I like football. I've watched it." Well, I've watched television programs, and I've been in hospital because I've been sick. But I'm not a doctor, so you you should go for the professional. Who knows his job? And the professional stands or falls. And if he's no good, you sack him. But what was happening was non-professionals were picking the players in some cases. And they were just, you know. And then you go to the I-League. That was a similar, where the committee were picking the players off and bringing the coach in last. I mean, I inherited a team. I had 35 players at one stage. It's far too many. And you'd look, sometimes I've been to teams where they have no left footers. Which doesn't sound much, but it makes a massive difference to the balance of a team. Or you might have someone who goes mad and buys four strikers, and you've got to again keep two of these strikers happy, and they're not, and they're getting paid a fortune when you desperately need a centre back. And so you're having some young kid in there, a centre back, who's getting abused by the fans, by the media, because he's not really good enough. But he's all you've got when you've got two expensive strikers on the bench because you can't play them anywhere else. Because that's bad planning. So there was a lot of bad planning in the I League. You, you've seen that. You know, the overpaid strikers in the I League and the underpaid defenders. You know, um, so, I mean, I don't mind the Indian lads getting paid. It would be the foreigners. Good luck to the Indian lads, their league. Uh, you know, I mean, my logic now, again, as an outsider, would be keep the ISL. But in the I League, keep the I League, yes. But have it as Indian players only. So more Indian lads are getting games, so they're not being kept out of the game by an average foreigner. So, you know, because some of the foreigners are not that good. Let's be blunt. You know, they're brought in, they're ripped off, the agents come in, they come the, the president who doesn't know anything about football. This lad plays and he's keeping an Indian boy out of the league who's not getting a chance. Now, 
if the I League consisted of 11 Indians playing every game, then they're going to get better. And then they move on to the ISL, where then they compete in a league with where there's eight Indians and maybe three foreigners in the first team. And, you know, they've got to then compete. But it means that there's more lads getting more minutes. And also it might mean the I-League lads are getting transfer fees, maybe, uh, which helps develop. And it helps them to develop youth players and gives them a chance to build youth academies. I mean, it's, uh, I know it won't happen because of the egos. But, I mean, I'm trying to think rationally and for the good of the game, if you can. You know, uh, I would have liked that to have happened, but I don't think it will. Good luck to you. <laughs> Definitely. And, like, uh, uh, I have another question from Rohit, okay? And he's here in the uh, meeting, but unfortunately, due to the internet issue, he, he has uh, sent in the question for me to ask. And he has uh, directed it towards to you, Steve. And he has said that you have managed a lot of teams and uh, at higher level at country level and everything and uh, you how often have you faced interference from people in higher positions in terms of transfers and team selection like he asks this because in terms of nepalese football according to him it's very common uh, just let him know that that happens every team everywhere in the world <laughs> and that's how you handle it and I, I try to work on the view that it's it's better to die on your feet than live on your knees. Uh, and everywhere I've gone, and sometimes it's nice. Sometimes they're just enthusiastic presidents who want to help. Oh, what about playing him? Sometimes it's not. It's, it's you will play him. Well, I don't last very long in those clubs. Uh, I'll be honest. You know, I mean, sometimes it's corruption. There are people who are getting appearance money and they're giving the appearance money a percentage back to the secretary in the club and things like this. So the secretary is starting to say, oh, you should play him because he's he's a great player. And in fact, he's not a great player, but he's getting an appearance money and he's trying to give you a bribe back. So you've, you've got to depend on... Yeah, I, I certainly never do that. I will never listen. I, I want to stand or fall on my own ability. I do know coaches who will do that. They will, they will just say yes to the president. They'll get their money. And then they'll just, you know, we have a phrase in English, it's called grin and bank it. They'll just grin and bank it, take the money and smile, you know, and, and they don't care. But I, I just don't want to live like that. I'd rather sleep happily and get the respect of your players, respect the game. And if I, if I, if I make the mistake, sack me. No problem with that. You know, I've got no hassles. <clears throat> but you sack me because of my mistakes, not because somebody else made the mistake. And they do interfere, believe me. Definitely, and like, uh, you know, like, staying with that, you know, like, uh, this again comes from one of the viewers, and it's like, uh, how do you motivate your players when there's a losing streak? Like you said, like, how you lost against uh, Korea in the qualifiers, how do you motivate them after the loss? Well, if I had the magic formula, <clears throat> I wouldn't be talking to you. I'd be a multimillionaire on my yacht in Monaco, you know, if I, if I had the magic formula. Um... Sometimes it's luck. Sometimes something happens. You know, it does happen. You get streaks of defeats and you're racking your brains out. What can I do? How can I improve this? How can I change? You try lots of different things sometimes. Sometimes it, it, it doesn't work. Uh, usually the most important thing is hard work. You keep doing what you believe is right. You keep doing it consistently and you will hope that it, it does work. You hope a little bit of luck happens, that the referee goes in your favour one time. Um, what you don't do is you don't start blaming. If, if you start blaming the goalkeeper, blaming the striker, what will happen then is your squad will split into groups. And you'll, rather than having one big bubble of a squad together, you'll have lots of different bubbles. And they'll start arguing with each other. And they'll start fighting with each other. And they won't then win again. The, 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 running, the losing streak will continue. You've got to get all the little bubbles together into one big bubble. If they're going to blame someone, blame you because you're the coach. But then you try and get them all to work together for one thing. It's, you know, it's, it, it is difficult. You know, you, you, what do you do? Do you change, make changes or do you keep faith and, and, and loyalty? 
you don't know is the answer. Sometimes a change, you bring a young kid in who will hit a hat-trick and everything suddenly changes. Sometimes you'll, you'll keep the same team out of loyalty and it eventually works or sometimes you get sacked because you haven't, you haven't been able to do it. So it's a good question, but complex answer. Definitely. And like, uh, I have one more. The next question is from Joel. He was right here and like, uh, he's like, again, again, due to the internet connection, we could not, uh, so uh, ask him directly. So he has sent me, he's like, uh, how re relevant is the UFA A license when you did it to now? Um, it's, well, it's different. It, things change as always, like all forms of education, they change. And, you know, whether that be your, a level in English or your degrees, everything evolves with time. In my time, 95% of it was on the grass. I had to coach players and I was assessed on coaching a player in a certain situation. 5% I had theory, very little theory, and it, it wasn't that difficult to be honest, the theory. Now it seems to be you have to be able to use a laptop or a, or a, or a the iPad, you know, there's so much theory now. And I think, to be honest, the, the, the coaching courses have become too theoretical because if you can't, the bottom line is you spend your time on the pitch when you're coaching. And if you can't do it on the pitch and if you can't work with the players, improve the players, it doesn't matter how many licenses you've got. You know, so uh, I think it has changed a bit. I'm not certain of it because obviously you don't see it all the time, but there has to be some theory, there has to be some learning, but the bottom line is get on the pitch. Can you improve a player? If you can improve a player, you can improve the team. Definitely. And like, uh, moving on to the next question, it's like, again, Sentin, it is like, uh, since you have managed many teams, you know, like across Asia, and uh, what do you see before signing for a new team? So what do I see before signing for a new project or a team? Me? What I see? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. I look at the money. <laughs> That's the first thing. <laughs> I've got to be honest. Uh, you look at the money because you have to. Because I, I believe me, I have to buy a house. And I have to pay my bills for my daughter. You know, I have to do and the electricity man and the food still costs money. So you have to. And also, I might be out of a job for 10 years. I might not get another job once I've been sacked. So you have to look at the money. Then I have to look at the length of the contract. Uh, then I have to look at the quality of the contract. Has it got a payout clause? And will I get the money if I get sacked? So if I get a three-year contract and and they sack me after one year, do I get the next two years pay? Well, I should do in a contract, uh, but some clubs will fight that. So you know, you've got to have, make sure you're, the money and the quality of the contract. Then you look at the club. Are you going to be happy? Because you've got to go there day in, day out. And sometimes you go to a club and everything works for you. And the quality of the administration is so important. But if you've got people inside the club who don't want you there from day one, they possibly wanted another coach. Or they maybe wanted a local coach or they wanted someone from Brazil. And they work against you while you're inside the club. It does go on specifically in Asia, more than anywhere else. Uh, you know, you, you, and sometimes you don't see it until you're in the club. Uh, I, I've been in clubs where I thought it was going to be good and I suddenly found that half the committee didn't like me, not because of me, because they didn't want, they didn't want me, they wanted somebody else, a local coach. Uh, now, wh whether that was because he was a great coach, I don't know, or whether because he would do as they said, I don't know. But... Uh, that is a problem. You've got to look at what makes you happy. But you have to be professionally ruthless first, financially, length the contract. Then are you happy? Then look at the players. Is it a realistic... I mean, if you if, if Klopp resigned today, what a job it would be to take over from Klopp now. Premier League champions, world champions, Super Cup champions, European champions. How on earth do you beat that? So... Or do you look at someone, you know, maybe mid Burnley, and can you get Burnley better? You know, you think where are you look at professionally? You say, 
How can I benefit professionally from this job? Sometimes the job is one of my most successful jobs was the, the president said to me, keep us up. That's all I want you to do is keep us up from going relegation. And we did. We happened to win the FA Cup as well as in Malaysia. So that was a bonus. But that's all they wanted. And I, and I sort of got an extra two years contract out of keeping this team up from relegation. And that, that, was what, that was a relatively good aim. So you have to have sensible goals as well as a coach. You know, it's, if you're someone, if you had Stoke, you're not going to win the Premier League. Let's be quite blunt about that. You know, there's only a certain block of teams are going to win the, the, the top trophies. Uh, and they keep winning them year in, year out. And it's going to get worse and worse, you know, because money does count. I don't know if that applies in, in Nepal, uh, but certainly I know in, in India, the big boys keep winning. And that's going to keep on happening. And that's where the money is, is you know, that's the reality of the world. The real, your know, footballers, the most money will buy the best players. The best players will win leagues. Usually. Not always, but usually. Definitely. And like, you know, like uh, on that note, I think now we are coming to the end. And before that, I'll just ask you some questions about current affairs. Like since you, I, I think you're a Liverpool fan and it feels very good to win. And going forward, uh, what do you think should be Klopp's idea? What should he do? I would never dream of telling Jurgen Klopp what to do. <laughs> because firstly, I think he's a great coach. It's the first thing. He's the nearest I've seen to emulating Bill Shankly. That's the nearest I've seen to him. He seems genuine. I've never met him. He seems genuine. He seems sincere. Uh, it doesn't seem like he's conning people. He looks like he loves football and he loves Liverpool. Uh, the people love him. So if I was Klopp, I'd just keep on doing what Klopp's doing. You know, maybe buy one or two to strengthen the squad if you can. And good luck if you can strengthen that squad. Definitely. So I'll take one last question before going. So uh, before wrapping it up. So it's from Mahesh. Okay, and like he's also there, but again, internet problem. And he has said that he owns an academy and uh, he wants to build it up. And he has a dilemma whether he should be a coach in the academy or the uh, director of football or some management because uh, he has to end of the day look after everything. What is your opinion? What should he do? Well. I don't know what a director of football does, because no one does. Uh, they got, there's loads of different ones all over the world, and they're all doing different jobs. Some are doing great jobs, some are grinning and banking it. So, to me, if he's running an academy, he needs two things. He needs good coaches to make sure the kids get better. And to be honest, he probably needs a good administrator. Uh, because if you're, edu if you're looking after the welfare of the kids, are, you, are they getting educated? Are they getting fed? Are they getting clothed? Are they getting sponsorship money coming in? Uh, are they getting looked after as people? That's very important as well, especially with kids. So I'd have, he should either become the administrator or the coach, depending on what his expertise is. And whatever he's best at, go for it. And if he's best at coaching, find a good administrator. If he can administrate, find a good coach. You know, because, uh, you know, it's, it's so important. You can't have a great coach if the kids are hungry, you know, or if the kids are well left looked after and they're just getting a kick around, they're not going to get better. So you've got to find both. Definitely. You know, like and on that note, I'll, I'd like to thank Steve for coming on the uh, webinar and maybe clearing whatever little bit doubts everyone had and uh, speaking to us, giving us almost one hour of your time, you know, like uh, to talk to us. So, uh, on that note, Steve, thank you so much for coming and uh, do you have anything to say? Only shukriya. That's my, one of my few words. I know a few others, they're usually bad words because I was abused quite a lot in at certain times, but I won't use them in front of you lot. <laughs> okay? Thank you so much. Thank you Cheers. everyone for attending and thank you Steve once again and hope to talk to you soon. Take care, stay yeah, safe. Let us know when it goes out. Cheers. Sure, thank sure. you. Thank you.